Alrighty, right, let's see if I remember how this is done. And it'd be nice if my camera would just stop autofocusing. Alright everybody, welcome to the first ever recording of Ninja News. Usually I used to do this on Twitch, but I've decided to do it in a more recording format, so that way you can watch it at any point in time you want, and view it at your own leisure. That way you don't have to worry about tuning in at any point in time during the week. And you can just, well, chill out at your own leisure. My name is Ash, aka Ninja Noxai, um, and I will be taking you through what I believe as the main talking points of this week. I will try to get as much news in as possible, but then again, there is a lot of news to cover, so I will do as best as I can. Now, also going on this point, um, I will also try and recapture what I've done in my week, try to make this a little bit more interesting, talk a little bit about myself, and go from there. If you want to know more about me, I will um, post some of my extra stuff where you can find me on social media and Twitch itself. But without further ado, let's get into the news. My time schedule goes from Monday to Sunday Australian time, which is uh, about Sunday to Saturday, say, over in America and Britain and stuff like that, but I'll try to keep it as consistent as possible. Riot has created its own League of Legends platformer based on community uh, suggestions. As part of the company's annual hackathon, which is the Thunderdome as they call it, some of Riot employees created a 2D platformer based on community suggestions. Uh, the game, Zig's Arcane Blast, is now available for general public consumption. The game was made within 48 hours, which uh, features Zig's lobbing bombs and fighting against an another arcade champion brand in a very simple and straightforward game. Seemed like a very straightforward 2D platformer. The community was asked to vote on multiple game types, whether it be 2D platformer, shooter, extra bits and pieces for League of Legends itself, and other vari uh, variety of game types, with different themes taken from the League of Legends to make up the general aesthetics, such as pool party, project, and other related items, such as bilge water as well. This isn't the first time, however, that Riot has done this thing from the hackathon, Thunderdome, with past projects including The Howling Abyss, which has become a staple in all random, all mid, and modding characters into a Super Smash Bros. game, which was actually pretty good. Now, my, as a part of the news, I will be get, as I said, I'll be giving my opinion, and on this, that's actually a pretty nice thing for Riot to do, where they just sit down and they listen to their community, where they take ideas from the community and say, what do you guys want to make? We're just going to throw it out. 48 hours, we're going to throw something out and give you guys it for free. It's all cool. We already give you League of Legends for free, but this time we're not going to give you this content as a part of a paid service. We're just going to give it to you. All good. So, as right, um, still seems to be going as a powerhouse for the MOBA genre. It is nice to see them work as this, trying to make it as good as possible. Um, Sony has also unveiled a limited edition Gran Turismo themed PlayStation 4. The console will have a silver uh, faceplate with the GT logo on it as well as a limited edition controller. The one terabyte console will also include the day one edition of Gran Turismo which includes uh, $250,000 in-game credit, a stickers pack, a chrome helmet and 60 PlayStation 4 avatars. That's a lot of avatars to include in a game. There will be other different combinations of the game in case you didn't want to buy the whole pack, which will be available in stores October 18th across UK, Europe, Australia, and Asia. I like the look of this console. It seems like um, Sony has hit the nail on the head with developing something as a special idea for the community. Like Riot, what they did just there, they listened to what they saw, and Gran Turismo is one of their biggest games. It's been going on since PlayStation 1. I remember playing Gran Turismo on PlayStation 1, then uh, Gran Turismo 2, 3, I think I did 4, uh, what are we up to now, 6? I can't remember, they've done so many of these recently. And I will not deny the fact that this looks superb as a game, it looks solid, and if it just runs at 30, then again, I'm not surprised about it, because of the fact of... Grand Turismo was never ever a PC game, so you don't expect it to go up to 60, so 30 will be a solid game for it, but if they do get a 60 with the PS4 Pro Edition, I like that idea, and it will be good to um, get hands on. So, October 18th, UK, Europe, Asia, and Australia, 
get ready to pick up that console in case you didn't want ha already have it or you want any other bits and pieces to go along with it. PlayStation's Twitter and Facebook accounts were briefly hacked last week, compromised uh, via the group Our Mine, who also gained who have also gained notoriety from accessing the HBO and the Game of Thrones accounts. The tweet messages sent out were just relatively harmless. However, um, they were there were claims that the PSN databases had also been compromised, which includes all relevant login information for users, all personal information, and banking details for if you were going to purchase items on the PSN store. Sony quickly regained access and deleted these posts. However, my, our mind.org did post about the company to get in contact with them in regards to this issue. I would like to say this from the start. White, hack, white hat hackers are good things for organizations. They look into vulnerabilities for companies and say, this is where you need to patch it up. This is what you have to do. That being said, ourmind.org, this is not how you go about it. You go up to the company in question and you report back to it and you ask them, can we do a security test on all your social media and other related security items? If they say yes, go for it. If they say no, well, you don't do anything. And this is just, this is not a smart idea. Sony's probably going to hit back at these guys hard if HBO haven't already did the exact same thing as well. But as a form of advertising as well, to think about it, they can get a lot of support from this. They could turn around and go to say Xbox or Nintendo or Microsoft. Well, I should. I don't know why I said Xbox and Microsoft. Um, Steam, Bethesda, Ubisoft, all the um, computer gaming brands. They can go out to them and say, "We've done this to Sony on their PlayStation sites. If you want your security to be up to scratch, come talk to us. We can give you the relevant information." But long and short of it, this is not the way you want to do it. This kind of made them infamous. So, not a smart idea. Xbox has announced the Project Scorpio Limited Edition Xbox One X, which promptly sold out in record times online. Announced to come out on November the 7th, pre-orders were available to purchase on the online store. The one terabyte edition, which will come with custom design, Exclusive vertical stand, limited edition controller, and renamed as a Project Scorpio will be available in stores. But if you wanted to pre order, you could go online and do it at the Microsoft online store. That being said, the site suffered a massive influx of customers trying to purchase the console, causing a massive drop down, like say, if you were going to get a Mini NES or Mini SNES and it being sold out in a matter of minutes up to about now they even did a second run of consoles to try and cope, cope with influx try and keep yourself in control when stuff like this comes out you've got to expect the fact that sometimes you will not get the console online when it comes up you might have to go into stores like, say, EB Gang or your Target or your Big W. I'm just talking because I'm Australian here. This is, these are my thing. Say over in America, you got your Walmart or your Game Stops, or over in um, Britain, you have your game retailers, and go up to them and say, "Okay, will you guys be stocking this?" If the answer is yes. Try and get a pre-order in there because they'll have X amount of stock. I don't know how much stock has been released for this. Hopefully, it's more than say. But the next this will be. But play by you. It will be all good then. Now, Overwatch has now teased its next map to be set in Australia. Along with the tease video release debuting the map, Blizzard released an animated short which included Junkrat and Roadhog called Junkertown The Plan. Junkertown will be a payload map in a set in Australia with a rusted post apocalyptic theme based on the war where the Omnic Crisis caused the fallout in Australia, which is a nice looking theme and very appropriate to the Roadhog and Junkrat characters. The map is currently live, uh, I don't know if it is live in PTE, um, it was live at Gamescom. Teaser trailer called Strife, with many people in Australia, and some found the wording to be uh, very offensive to indigenous communities, however Jeff Kaplan did not acknowledge this controversy, however apologising 
in some text differences on the signs in Australia being different to wording of signs in America. Jeff, you've got a lot to learn. Firstly, get some PR people from Australia to come and talk to you in America. You have completely and utterly ignored the past that's happened in it. Everybody knows about the Civil War and African American, well, Amer African Americans where their heritage came from Africa and they were brought across as slaves on slave boats. In Australia, it's a bit of a different story upon which it was already populated by the First Nation or AKA Aboriginals Indigenous Australians. There was a massive colonization upsetting via the First Fleet upon which they tried to segregate and completely and utterly remove anything to do with the Australian cultural heritage in the way of in the way of Aboriginal heritage and the people that originally owned this land. Not understanding this is a massive backlash on your behalf and you really need to think better about this. Terminologies we can be perfectly fine about, we will understand, but not being culturally sensitive is some shit that we will not put up with. Well, about a good majority of Australia won't put up with, there's some xenophobics still around, but we don't talk about those much, unlike just then. Thing is coming to PC. Announced at the NVIDIA's briefing ahead of Gamescom last week, Square Enix announced the company will be releasing the Ultimate Edition on PC. The game will also be utilizing the Games Works technology, which will improve already high quality effects in the game, such as hair effects, grass effects, lighting, shadows, and facial expressions. The game will also be able to run at an upscaled, well, not really upscaled, but a properly rendered 4K definition and 60 FPS being boasted upon release for all frame rate uh, resolution levels. The only confirmation of a release date for this is in tw early 2018. I've seen a few screenshots, I've seen the trailer that they dropped for this. It looks good. It looks like something that could be extremely well received by the community um, Republic and also the fact of there's also talk that they're going to be releasing mods for it which would be great um, it will also be nice to see a bit more support and a bit more community interaction like apparently it's not doing too well on console I cannot comment on that I've only heard rumors I cannot guarantee facts but it could be the case with that being said there's also talks of it going to the switch they've teased that at Gamescom uh, the lead CEO of Square Enix said yeah it's a possibility also they released a chibi like compact pocket version of Final Fantasy 15 for I think it was the Game Boy might be mobile I cannot guarantee those facts because I completely missed that news story but I know it's coming out the console uh, the chibi pocket version but in the meantime I'm really looking forward to Final Fantasy 15 on the PC it looks good Age of Empires 4 has been officially announced at the end of the live stream at Gamescom celebrating 20 years of Age of Empires Relic Entertainment who have previously made the Dawn, uh, Dawn of War series and multiple other RTSs have announced that they're working on a sequel to the game. Microsoft hasn't added much more to the announcement but a trailer has been officially released teasing warriors and soldiers from all different type areas, all different locales around the world. No confirmation on a release date for the sequel, however, Age of Empires 1, the Definitive Edition, is slated for October 19th with the Definitive Editions of Age of Empires 2 and 3 in the works. Microsoft, you've put a loss on your plate, and it's understandable to pass it over to Relic to develop the fourth game. You've got a lot to do. But saying we want the uh, Definitive Editions of 2 and 3 is a bit of a stretch. Age of Empires 2 ha already has its high definition release on PC. It looks good. It's fine. It's just everything that you want from a game that was released back in the early 2000s and you wanted to run on your current PC today. 
That being said, having a definitive edition come out not too long afterwards is a bit of a money grab. Will you be patching it in so uh, users who already have the high definition will get the definitive edition? Will that be in free upgrade? Or are you going to gouge us more money out and say buy more? If, it, if the latter is coming to truth, I am saying you bastards. That's just me. That's like that. The Age of Empires 4, the trailer that I saw of it, interesting. Because there's heroes and warriors, all from the bronze, working from Stone Age for that matter, going up to, say, what's the word I'm looking for here? The American Civil War. So you've got gunpowder units versus people with a shield and sword, which the sword is not exactly what I'd call modern. That means it does mean I'm not looking forward to it. Relic have made some solid RTSs. Dawn of War 3, I can't 100% guarantee I never played that, but Dawn of War 1 and 2, good games. Very good games. Look forward to hearing about more on the release schedule when it comes out. Gwent is getting a $850,000 tournament series. Now that's in US dollars, so convert it to the numbers and the currency as you see fit. The game with, that started as an in-game playable lecture in Witcher 3, and now on its own game in open beta, has given the season-based competition mode from Pre CD Project Red called Gwent Masters. Separate from the current ranked mode, the Masters will allow players to compete in online tournaments that may qualify them for the first ever Gwent World Masters, with a prize pool of over 250,000, well, up to. 250,000 US dollars. There are three tournament tiers with Gwent Opener, Gwent Open and Gwent Challenger rounding out the three with a prize pool on 25,000 US dollars and 100,000 US dollars respectively. With eight Open and four Challenger events, the total prize pool sits at 850,000 US dollars altogether. Each tier has its own qualifying ranks and once you get there if you're the top 200 you qualify for the Gwent Masters. I think Gwent is getting a bit hungry in the way that they're saying that they want to make a car tournament thing just like Elder Scrolls they threw that out and then you've also got Quake Championships the world champions came out this weekend or upcoming weekend depending on which um, uh, locale you're talking about um, but that's assume you're assuming your game will become good enough that on the get-go it will happen and it will be awesome. Whether or not it's going to be the true fact, I don't know. Could actually boost up sales and uh, rally up support very much so, but the, the game, as I said, is in beta, so I don't know. Let's see. Let's play by ear and see where it goes from there. Six years later. Bethesda has brought Brink into free-to-play. Announced on Wednesday, with absolutely no fanfare, the game has gone free-to-play on Steam. The game, published by, uh, by Bethesda and developed by Splash Damage, was a class, well, is a class-based class shooter um, meant to compare with Team Fortress 2. After, announcing, after the announcement, the game's in-game population did boost, however, from 10 to 30 people up to thousands playing it. Here's a problem about Brink. Brink was designed to be a competitor to a game which had a long standing and applicable fan base, but at the same time, it's kind of now dated and I'm surprised it's still alive. Also, going free to play at this point in time with, with uh, Brink is kind of let loose, long term, shot itself in the foot. Can't do much about it. They can't. It's just dead. You can't do much about it. Um, so making me go free to play right now is too late. I, even though thousands of people are playing it right now, it's you're not going to get enough support with it. Bethesda, you should have thought of this at the get go. That's what tanked Battleborn, and that's what's tanked a few other uh, MOBAs that have come out of the game. They just said, "Pay for us. We'll go with it," and then all of a sudden, just die. Bit sad, but you win some, you lose some. Long and short of it, I don't think Brink is well 100% what you'd call a worthwhile successor to Team Fortress 2. Even though it's not a successor, it's 
kind of sort of thing. Win some, you lose some. I could send this and lose, Bethesda, just leave it. Fires Pack 2 announced for Injustice 2, which has brought in Raiden, Black Mantra, and of all characters, Hellboy. Announced during a live stream at Gamescom, the characters will be released in the next fight, next pack from Nether Realms. The trailer that accompanied the announcement showed off Raiden beating up the previous uh, Fighters Pack's characters before going toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other. The Fighters Pack will be on sale from September 12th. That's a curveball. Nobody expected Hellboy to come in. People thought possibly Spawn. People were betting, hedging on Beast Boy. People were thinking, oh, it's going to be more um, DC heroes and stuff like that. But out of nowhere, grabbing Hellboy and saying, here we go, go nuts. That's a curveball. And I like it. I love the back how it's just like, okay, the Fighters Pack 1 is out. Yeah, they were new partners. Come check these guys out. They can do punches and they got missiles. This guy's got a big rock hand. He's going to light his cigarette and fire from a missile. He's cool. I have to admit, Hellboy is actually a very cool character. And I'll be interested to see how he plays in the game. I've really got to also get around to getting Injustice 2 because it looked like a very solid fight. I'm not going to play it online, but it'd be fun just to play. Overwatch has dropped also another new animated short this week. This time for one hero in particular, May. The short, titled Rise and Shine, explores May's background, detailing her time as in Antarctica as well as the loss of her friends. This short also explores her friendship with Snowball, her robotic cat companion, as well as how she made her ice gun. This short is what I'd consider a true heart tugger. Something that you would sit down and you'd watch and you just go, mm, I got all the feels. This is, this is really, really strong. And you see the heartbreak in it, and she really conveys emotion. That's really good. At the same time, everybody's like, I'm still considering May be the devil. She is a bit heartless when she comes to freezing someone and shooting the ice thing in their head. But then again, there's not much you can do about it, because that's just the way she plays. May's just like that. However, seeing her build the contraption from the gecko. it's actually a nice little touch. I'd like to see them make a skin for her based around what she did down in Antarctica. Outside of that, it's a lot better than Junkrat's The Plan, Junkertown The Plan. It was actually, seemed quite nice and a lot of memes came from it, but outside of that, good work, Blizzard. Speaking of good work, they're now in the process of overhauling Mercy, changing her alt and giving her a new skill. In last week's developers update, Jeff Kaplan has specified his concern as well as many other players' concerns with Mercy. At the, as he states in the video, too many players go play her as a go and hide and seek character, waiting for others to die, preferring not to heal as much when she's got her alt up and running, waiting for everybody to just go down. And if someone's run off on their own, they're not going to get a healing because that's not where the bulk of the uh, characters are. There's also been talk of why doesn't she have a secondary skill, whereas most other characters do. And Jeff has agreed, yes, that's actually a good idea. We need to address this concern. So in this uh, developer's update, he's pointed out that they've done two things to Mercy. The first one is her ult will now become a cooldown ability. So. It's a single target ability to a single hero, and it has a cooldown, so you don't have to charge it up every time, but you have to still get in the go. Heroes never die, and the person's back up. From what I've seen on the information on PTE, it's about 30 seconds. The second thing is her new alt is called Valkyrie. Valkyrie has a three-step process. One, she can fly consistently. Two. She can heal and boost multiple enemies, I mean allies, at once. And three, her resurrect comes from 30 seconds down to eight. So she can zip across the field and heal, res, res, heal, shoot, shoot, shoot. Her shooting ability is extremely boosted as well. That's another thing that they're adding on to this. And as I have previously stated, the new changes are 
live on the PTE with a large amount of positive feedback coming from players and other people alike. I like it. My The way I play Mercy is I don't sit back and just do stuff. I like to resurrect people. I like to get in there and do my part as a healer. Being a healer should be the person who, even though he sits back, well, in this case, she sits back, you're still helping people and you still get the heals in even though you're going to get copper beating. And you're playing hide and sink just waiting for everybody to go die and then heroes never die enough. Another concern that Jeff Kaplan also raised in this video is the fact of people who didn't like the fact that when they cast their whole team alt, all their work is done and just gone to waste and their, all their heroes are back up and running. Which at the same time is a bit of a dick move, but is probably one of the key pieces to Mercy's kit. Still, that being said, I like the way that they've restructured her. Her flying ability in this one and her boost and damage is pretty good. And the fact that she can heal and boost multiple enemies, that's also very nice to fly around and just go, yeah, everybody gets a heal. And it was just solid. So I'm really looking forward to these ch changes going live in the live servers and seeing how people react to them from there, instead of waiting for the PTE and trying them in there. That is all the time I have for this week with news. Now I know it has been a bit short, I will try and add more news in next week, but in the meantime, if you have any further um, news topics that you'd like me to discuss next week, feel free to post in the comments below, otherwise like, comment, subscribe, you know that stuff that everybody else talks about or come join me on twitch at any point this week at twitch.tv forward slash ninja noxai or come follow me on twitter to see when i'm going to do stuff on there as well at twi uh, twitter.com forward slash ninja noxai i hope you all enjoyed this video critique it also below whenever you want to do and i will see you all next time